is, especially mm-hmm. since, especially since there's like everything's already done. What can I do that's new? But you have to think everything is reinvented. No one's original, but they're still, you know, having successful lives. It's just you have to identify for yourself again what's your value, if that makes sense. <laughs> Actually, the trauma. I don't know. I felt like when I could link my own trauma to mm-hmm. an archetype, right? When I could realize, oh, those wise people understood me, right? Because mm-hmm. um, when you're going through it, you think you're the most isolated. You feel totally isolated, mm-hmm. right? And then if you can listen to some music or something where somebody gets it, like somebody has been there, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And th- it's that's what very it relieving. Yeah, I think so. I that's at least helped me a lot. Um, and that to me is the humanities part of the education. If you get that, then you know I really need to read this stuff. Right? <laughs> and and not only that, I need to read history because I need to read how many traumatized people there are in my society based on the history, the policy, right? Because it's affecting the society. And my daughter is a, technically an economics writer, but she, she would love to write an article about the economic cost of trauma. <laughs> oh, yeah, right? <laughs> my gosh, how many crimes are committed because people have been traumatized and they overreact? right? Then they end up in prison. Well, does that help? No. Then they get yelled at even more, right? Then they get sent out with no job, no housing, nothing. Guess what? They end up back in prison, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. Uh, It's nuts. Anyway, so that's good, Ivy. And I do want to point out that I think Alicia and I spotted it, right, Ivy? <laughs> that you, I'm sorry? That Alicia and I spotted it when yeah. you were, yes. Do you remember that? Yeah. Was that helpful that we're sitting Yeah, I, especially like having conversations with you guys and knowing that it's, you know, normal and it will pass. I feel like that is a lot helpful. Um, I know you guys said that you went to therapy later on and like later on that might be something that I do but for now it's just helpful to know that it's it's just a tribulation (laughs) right and and neither one of us could go when we were your age and your situation because we absolutely had to take care of what was right there there wasn't any it's survival you know (laughs) okay Warren sorry we just had a little woman's group one day when you were okay. there. <laughs> it's okay. And, <laughs> and there were certain things about it that were just, yeah, women get this. Well, this is partly being a woman too. So sorry, Warren, we're not going to take you with us there. No need to apologize. I don't have a problem if I come along with you guys. <laughs> I mean, it broadens we, my knowledge. We think you're great to a point, Warren. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so let's see. Um, uh, Alicia, why don't you go next? With We're doing the reading number three, and then I'm going to tie them together and make you react again, okay? Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, let me scroll back up. Okay. All right, when he was talking about theater, I like the opening line, or well, the quote at the opening, where they said acting is about discovering the character within yourself, which goes back to, like you and I were talking about, Dr. Beck, watching the Greek tragedies as one of the ancient Greek citizens was finding yourself within the characters of the tragedy and finding out how 
to relate the story so that you could see what happened in these people's lives and how they handled it and what the outcomes were. Um, I put, let's see, theater has therapeutic possibilities. Well, duh. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was in my, I put that in parentheses. Um, theater, oh, theater helped a sick, self-depreciating boy gain a sense of self. Uh, and pleasure by putting on the different personas of the characters. It gave him a chance to kind of figure out who he was or who he liked being. Um, and it gave him a chance to see, you know, what he could be like or what he will be like in the future when his, yeah, he was, really really sick and I, I I think that eventually he got to where he could go out and about yeah he did he they put him in the theater group um but you know it gave him a chance to imagine what his life could be like when he isn't so sick that he can't participate in life anymore um I thought it was really interesting that they used therapy as a military pro or theater as a military program. And then after this, it was one specific Orestia. Right. Yeah. Um, after it showed, they all had to sit down and have a discussion. Um, oh, Ajax, it was Ajax. Oh, okay. Um, and like, like Ivy said, becoming more trauma aware as a society is <coughs> important and I think people are finally starting to see that PTSD isn't something reserved just for veterans and um, let's see I, I was given that diagnosis myself back in 2019 and I told one of the professors about it and I was asked well, what is it that gave you PTSD? Oh. Like, and, and you know, was you that a think, psychology professor? It, it was a psychology professor. And it wasn't, um, <laughs> the question wasn't like, oh my goodness, what happened? You know, do you feel like you can talk about it? The question was like, uh, you're not a soldier. That's kind of, what the feeling that, okay. is like. Here's the irony, the irony. <coughs> the psychology professor <coughs> does that, and the philosophy professor who's supposedly into strength of mind and tranquility goes, <laughs> I get it. I mean, the ironies, right? It's so ironic. And then, I mean, you have to learn why did somebody go into psychology? Why did somebody go into philosophy? You know, and anyway life is long and lots of things are upside down so go ahead alicia okay um okay and then the three veterans with cases of ptsd that worked with a playwright and then three actors by trade i don't remember their names but they were they're actually pretty big names yeah, that's right um they came and uh they actually sat down and they talked about helplessness and addiction and alienation and being able to see that within the characters helps you because sometimes you cannot talk to anybody else that makes you too vulnerable. But having that discourse in your head, I'm in class having that discourse in your head is still helpful you know um let's see music uh is a uniquely human way by which we find hope courage and inspiration it brings people together who on their own are weak you know you remember when we were talking about the evolution of violence 
it kind of reminded me of that community that stands together against the one power. Um, the power That's Freud. That, that was Freud. Right. Okay. But this isn't like a physical community. It's more like they communicate on a spiritual level, I guess. It's like, it's, I don't know, just a big emotional support, whether you're in the same room with the person singing or you're listening to the radio or anything. Uh, it has the power to express what people can't give voice to in any other way. Um, I said, it was interesting to read that music has been used as a mediator between revenge and the act of giving testimony um, against the trauma inflicted upon self and family. Uh, it had something to do with people who had been enslaved. I don't remember the example exactly, but in the midst of giving the testimony, they, uh... okay, answer it. Let him know I'm sick and let him know that I'm in school. <laughs> if he wants to wait, I'll talk to him in a minute. <coughs> um. Okay, so my biggest takeaway is it helps to confront the painful realities of life. We're conditioned to cut ourselves off from the truth of what we're feeling. Uh, traumatized people are afraid to experience emotions because it leads to the loss of control. And I really agreed with that. Um, and theater is a safe place. Like I said, speaking to one-on-one -on -one to people is it you, it almost feels like a violation, you know, because you're opening yourself up to be hurt again. You're too exposed. Um, so awareness has increased about how trauma affects the mind, brain, and body, interpersonal and personal relationships. Neuroscience is now coming in, gives a better understanding of the physiological changes in the brain. Like it really changes how the brain works you're not as organized you're not as attentive um i just I, I really like the book uh because it's kind of putting together a lot of studies i've done on my own in the past about stress and stress related illnesses um so i just i didn't have I didn't have a lot of big aha moments because it's not new material for me, but I'm just sitting here. Yeah, you're right. That's right. Yes, that's actually the one thing this book might do for you is link together your interest in religion and philosophy mm -hmm. with the stuff you do in psychology. <laughs> so many times over and over, he says, we were just making progress in this area linking about ideas and relationships and then this set of drugs came along and it made a profit boom or we were just making progress and then that diagnosis you know that huge book with the 300 that just focused on behavior was this regress to the enlightenment and we got nowhere for a few decades i mean mm -hmm. over and over again he just says we were moving in this direction and then some profit driven event occurred, right? That the American Philosophical Association got a whole lot of money for their diagnostic manual. So boom, you know, isn't that sad? I mean, but that's the link. That's the link between philosophy. Yeah, and I, I wrote a paper about on something like that. Um, something about following the new fad like there were things in the past that have been used as treatment methods and or medicine for certain issues um that just kind of fall by the wayside under these new 
creations, but then these old things come back up again, like, aha, uh -huh, look what I have discovered. And it's not a new discovery. It's something that worked, but because it wasn't the new popular thing, you know, and it didn't make yes. sense. Yeah. Like, uh, I, I was, it, it had to do with medicine used around the time that asylums were still in place. Um, like electric shock therapy, if it's done right, it can be beneficial and it's still used for extreme cases, but water therapy, if it's done correctly, I mean, there's good information there. And whenever the shift in medicine uh, went toward the humors and away from like spiritual and emotional, like going to the spas and relaxing and healing, that's the same kind of thing. So I don't know, we just get blinded by this new, exciting, interesting information. I'll see if well, I can put yeah, that paper. The other thing is that if you do behavior or drugs, you get this cause effect on mm -hmm. paper. But he says, it's not that, it's about relationships. Mm -hmm. If you don't heal relationships, it doesn't matter. Like your genetics, you pass on to the next generation can be affected by your relationships. And so that you can't measure on this cute little cause effect thing, right? And that it's not precise. You just have to try to create a community so people feel safe. <laughs> their brain kicks in and that I th is what i talk about when i talk about the white stuff in the back right mm -hmm. as opposed to this stuff in the front that's starting to deteriorate because it's over stimulated and then people get too impulsive because the the thing to reflect is not growing or shrinking and the stuff that's impulsive is being overstimulated, and so Again, they're going to not only react to trauma, they're going to cause trauma in other people when you act impulsively like that, right? Oh, it's sad. Okay, Warren, what you got? Um, <clears throat> As Alicia was talking, I was making some mental notes, and I share similar thoughts, especially with the part where she says, um, coming across with the material, she didn't have any like big aha moments because myself and her and myself, we're psychology majors. So some of these things we already knew, but to see it in a different context is what's new to us. And the part where, where this reading says, um, the world is basically evolving. Um, people are becoming more aware of what is going on. The reason, and I think as she said, that has been going on for a long time but because of the money-based part of it, where, oh, if this one did not make me X amount of dollars, I'm not gonna really put it out there. And I'm just really glad that people are seeing that there are different ways to deal with trauma as opposed to the traditional way of going in an office, sitting and talking with someone who you have no affiliation with and you do not know anything about the person. Even though you that give has them a prescription. Exactly. And even, even though that has its upsides to it, because some of the times you want to speak to someone who is neutral, I would say. Like they don't know you and they don't know of the situation in a sense. Because it's different if I'm talking to someone I know about something that I'm going through as opposed to talking to a stranger who is a doctor. The doctor will give me some insight and he's a neutral person, but at the same time, he doesn't know me. And that is why it is very important to build, they teach us that we should build rapport with our patients, like get to know them and almost in a sense, like try to imagine yourself being in their shoes, but not too much because that will affect the treatment process. And I just, and at the start of when you were talking about like listening to music or all that type of stuff, most people don't push these things or the doctors won't necessarily push them to say, do this because it's not a medication. 
and it won't make them make money. Because to be honest, I personally, my view on doctors is that I, even though it's, it might be bad, but for me personally, I stay away from, from, from doctors in a sense, not say like psychiatrists or those types of people, because I have seen many cases where like, you go to see the doctor, they know what's wrong with you and they know how to help you, but they give you something that is not gonna help you immediately, but something for you to come back to them. Then they give you the thing that really works for you. I've seen that multiple times happening and they just know that, okay, if they give this, it might help you, but it's not what you want. And you're gonna have to pay to come and see them again. I've seen that happen in multiple occasions. And it's just that when books like these are out there for the public to see, maybe then they can start internalizing on their own to say, let me try this. Because really, they won't be losing anything but time. They won't be losing money because it's there free. So if you try to say, let me try to find some music that might help me or something else, then I would see where most of our problems will be solved on our own. But then again, there are certain issues where you can't solve on your own, where you need a doctor. And like for PTSD, in a sense, that field as well is um, becoming, it's actively changing. Because for PTSD, the, the major thing with the whole stress thing that I've learned is that to be, to say that you have PTSD, it is the time they look at. Because they now have a thing they call acute stress disorder. That is before PTSD. That takes, that can be diagnosed from two, two days of post-trauma to four weeks. Then they say anything after four weeks, that's PTSD. So usually before the four week period, people were, people were diagnosed to not have anything or to say nothing is wrong with them because they were saying oh it has to be four weeks after the trauma has happened in order for you to be saying okay you're suffering from a stress disorder but now they came up with acute stress disorder which is before so as i said it's just everything just keeps evolving 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 and us as human beings we yearn we yearn for understanding like if someone understands, we always search for someone to understand us. People might say, oh, I don't care what people say, but really and truly deep down inside, we do care what people say because it affects us. And if we have someone who understands us or if we realize we're not the only ones going through things like these, then they'll be able to come forward. That is why I feel that this day and age, we are more aware that trauma is real in people. Because say for instance, I'm suffering from trauma and I'm just a regular nobody. And I'm saying, oh, I don't want to talk to anyone because I might feel ashamed and this and that. But if I turn the TV on and I go on the news and I see someone of standard and someone of importance come forward and say, I suffer from this that is similar to my, that is similar to what I'm suffering from. I myself, I'm going to want to come forward to say, okay, if this person is in this position and they're suffering from this, myself as a nobody should not be ashamed to come forward. And that is why I think this generation is becoming more aware because we have like big name individuals coming forward to say, I have suffered from this. I'm, I'm stressed out because of this. I, face major depressive disorder and all that types of stuff. And I think that is the reason why the evolution is the way it is. It is becoming more prevalent that people are understanding that um, it is okay to say you have had traumatic experiences and it's okay to not want to see a therapist because it, it is not the only way to go about getting treatment. Okay. Um, yes. I'd say the Me Too movement, right? That mm -hmm. was when women, you know, famous actresses started coming out. And then a lot of women decided, yeah, right? 
the thing is, it just peaked and then it disappeared because, mm -hmm. because men don't want to give up their lust, you know? And I just think it's hard to maintain it. And women get so many kudos, you know, they get power, they get money from appealing to male lust. And so I, you know, I think there's a certain layer of people that go to a higher level, but what, there's just plenty that don't. For example, there was a woman who reported one of the Senate candidates for Georgia, Roy somebody, was actually a pedophilia. And he used to stalk 15, 16 year olds in shopping malls, Roy Moore. And this one woman came out and said, yeah, I can't remember if he just stalked her or if he approached her or whatever. And it turned out he lost the election, just barely, right? I'm sure that that lady got polarized and she has said nothing. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm sure there's a whole cohort of women where you don't say that because then your political party won't win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that could happen on either side too. Um, so that I was going to mention the next step is political polarization is that people are traumatizing each other or they're acting out of traumatic experiences, which is leading to this political polarization which is making people even more afraid, unable to trust people, breakdowns in relationships, family breakdowns because the polarization is so bad. And so I would say our political situation right now is a combination of the product of trauma and it's creating more trauma. Does that make sense, you guys? Yes. Um, all right, so another thing I think is really important is, oh yeah, I was going to say that the therapist, if you think of it, an ideal therapist would actually be your alter ego, right? It would be, they would be personifying. You would be able to project your mind, right? your highest level of the good. Remember he said, you're supposed to imagine yourself as a little kid that was whole at one point. And you also want to get to that point where there's like, there's somebody in charge of all these other people talking inside of you. And if you had a really good relation with your therapist, that's what your therapist would become for a while, you would have to, you know, it would have to be the therapist, but after a while, the therapist could point out to you that I just am your own mind, right? What you learn from me has to do with you, not with me so much. But then the therapist can say, I think you're using me very well because I think you think I'm helping you become more reflective, but actually you're doing the work. And I just mm -hmm. want to tell you that you are a, a very good patient because you are truly nurturing yourself. And I'm just, I'm just the one you need to be there to watch the process and then to confirm with you that you are doing what you need to do. Does that make sense? Yes. And then again, it's that deeper part of your brain that's becoming aware of itself. Now then the key is when we already mold kids not to have that isn't developing naturally or it's shrinking, can we truly build it back? right? Which I hope so. I hope so. But 
that is a huge project. <laughs> um, all right. So the other thing I wanted to say was um, this article that I got. Again, there's always this synchronicity. The trouble with me is whenever I read the paper, I, I have used a lot of paper because I always print stuff out because, oh my God, that's totally related to what we're doing in class. Um, but this time, what I wanted to point out, oh my gosh, how did I get there? Um, was this article about um, church services in um, what's going on in church services, which is super scary because they're taking all of those tools that Mr. Vonderkoek is saying are powerful, right? So Mr. Vonderkoek is pointing out how positive this is, but just the Greeks also perverted their tradition. Like they used it to justify this stuff and they used it to, to feed the irrational desires and confirm them and sort of say, well, if Agamemnon can do that, I can do that, you know? Oh, yeah, geez. So anyway, um, you could point out, right, that now all these, and, and they're very specific, music, song, dance, you know, all the alleluias, all this stuff, is getting tied into thinking that the election was stolen and having, you know, and praying for the, the political prisoners, the way that Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement used to pray for the people in jail for, you know, defending African Americans. So we, oh my God, we've got all the same techniques but dedicated to this purpose of empire building. It's an empire supporting religion. So it's, you know, a complete reversal. So this is, but I mean, I've said this with all of them, remember Augustine and then how it got perverted and Aquinas and how it gets perverted. So even Mr. Van der Kolk's wonderful discussion, uh, can get in the hands of the wrong people and really get um, perverted. So now, you know, Mr. Trump is the new, the God figure, you know, the daddy in the sky, whatever. And people don't want that ambiguity like Mark Edmondson talks about or like Martin Luther King talks about that if you really want to be an adult, you have to live with ambiguity. Um, and, and then also, when I, even before this, when I used to watch the, um, the rallies like at Charleston and stuff, you think how many of those tough guys, remember he said that the, the little boys that were sexually abused by a priest. As adults, they push iron, they go into these conditionings, they really act tough. They're really, you know, they're obsessed with, with bodybuilding and being tough. Well, how many of those people that you see, like the motor, you know, all the stereotype, the motorcycle guys, the Harley, you know, with his girl, or the the truck, um, I remember after 9-11, the weekend after, there were these trucks driving around with these huge Confederate flags and, you know, all this tough guy stuff. How many of those underneath it, either they were in a war situation and they have PTSD from that and they're trying to tough, you know, be the tough guy, or they were abused as kids either some horrendous sexual thing or else just flat old violence feeling powerless. Now they're in control or um, 
let's see, there's violence at home, war, or they're afraid that they're not going to get a decent job and be able to be the provider in the little advertisement with the wife, the sexy wife and the two kids, and just be stable and just have your pickup truck. And they just are completely anxious about that. They have status anxiety. They can't get as much status as their grandpa or their dad. So underneath that is just, you know, a collapse. And I, I just, it was so hard to live in Batesville because obviously I can't reach out to these people and say, you know, I think you're hurting, right? I mean, they would just like, ah, you know, but I just, I know that people would look at me in Batesville. I didn't even have to talk. And they just knew that I was one of them. You know, I was one of those faculty members that got brought in some Yankee from the North. And I don't know, it was just so hard because I, I don't think like that. I think like what it's like to be a mother in the ghetto of Philadelphia and trying to protect your kid from the drug dealers and the dogs and stuff. Like they would never think that I lived through that. And also I, the guy who fixed my car, his worldview is that if you go to church, you stay on the straight and narrow, you go fight for your country, you come home, you start your own body shop. It just makes sense. And so he's not the tough guy, tough, you know, but. But he's voting for people that don't care about him. And it it's just so agonizing. <laughs> so you just have to be able to live with all of that. If you're ever going to be able to have a democracy and ever hope to be able to relate to people, to not cause trauma, even if you've been traumatized, I mean, it's just really spiritually difficult. And um, so I guess my question would be to you, can you understand how all this stuff that sounds good could also be used for evil? All right, Alicia, what do you think? QAnon, right? QAnon is like a club. People come, they feel good. They're, they're protecting the world from pedophile democrats or something well at we least <clears throat> we use religion to bind ourselves together right but then anything that doesn't fit within those those binds that's other that's outside and we fear it and so we act against it and so it's one of the most powerful forces for good and for bad yeah but you it add is. trauma right you add how much yeah. trauma there is in our society <coughs> then then these people can't afford to go to therapy yeah but it, but it would be so hard for them to actually break down all those defenses that have been set up for so long does that make sense yeah and to lose control. And he said that a lot of Vietnam vets, they can't go there. Um, my best friend from high school was a psychiatric nurse, spent her whole career trying to deal with them because they did develop, uh, you know, they were abusers. They were in jail or prison for abuse. They were drug users. I mean, they had big problems, um, but it was all related to that huge trauma of the Vietnam War. And they didn't come back to the ticket tape parade, which helps some, right? The World War II vets didn't have it as much. They had it, but they didn't have it to the degree that Vietnam vets did because the Vietnam ones just lost, you know, I, any idea of themselves. Like there were Vietnam vets that went over there and they get over there and they go, we're the British. 
you know, these guys are fighting for their freedom and we're the empire builders. What the hell is this? Mm -hmm. And the self-doubt that they had. And there were a lot of deaths that were friendly fire that were actually the guys killing each other. It was that much of a just a collapse in any kind of ethical justification for what's plain old horrible, right? And so, I mean, the story of that one vet that went ballistic and ended up killing children and stuff, that's, that happens even if it's actually a just war. But if you come home and find out you were getting manipulated for money and power, and it was not a just war, oh my God, can you imagine the, the other layers of how do you pick yourself up? <coughs> or, um, and we've got just got a lot of that stuff in our society. Um, what about you, Warren? Can you understand how it gets abused? Can I understand what? <clears throat> how all of these good techniques for therapy can also get abused. Like you were saying, you know, not everyone has to go to a therapist. Well, what happens yes, if you everything, end up everything good, everything good can be abused. Just like how we have uh, certain doctors are afraid of prescribing certain drugs for anxiety because they fear the addiction that it might cause their patients or their patients might become addicted to it because of how it helps them and how it makes them feel. So I can totally understand how the things that are good can turn out to be bad. Yeah. So it's just a constant process of self-examination. Like yes. there's no silver bullet. And remember when he said, I can't tell you how many conferences I go to with scientists who are looking for the next silver bullet. But that's the way science works, right? Because it's mm -hmm. natural cause effect. But if we are very at a very, very basic level, social beings, like culture is a second nature to us. Our genetic, what we pass on genetically is affected by our social relations you're never going to find a silver bullet, not even close, because you could have a family system where one person in the family is completely traumatized and another one not at all. You could have that even if one of the kids didn't go to Vietnam. But I mean, if one of the kids went to Vietnam, oh my God, right? I mean, there's so many ways that little kids are so vulnerable and human beings throughout their lives need really mature friends to get through life. And that's why Jesus and Confucius and Buddha, all those traditions say the you have to have Aristotle, you have to have the right friends or you're not going to be able to like have good judgment day in and day out. You have to have someone to reflect with that really is insightful. Now, what if you, the people you talk to also project their shadow onto other people and also are part of the movement? and you've got yourself all emotionally connected to a movement that claims to be saving the world from these pedophiliac Democrats or Democrats that are awful, you know, going to hell for some reason or another. It's just, it's such a dangerous moment. That we have. Does that make sense to you all? Yeah. Okay, so yes. we will move on to the next thing. I might start next time with weaving together the, the three readings, but um, we'll move on to some other stuff. I've got current stuff. I think the next one is a neuroscientist, highly respected that I wrote a book about <laughs> disagreeing with them along these same lines, actually. So. All right. All right, we'll see you. Bye-bye.